I'm currently going off uh, two slices of peanut butter toast that I had at 4.30 a.m. this morning. <laughs> oh, shit, dude. Really? I just go bop, 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 bop from thing. Yeah, but I've had a lot of coffee. I'm good to go. So, guys, we have our third mailbag episode now. We've done three of these things? Well, this, well we're about to do three. Oh, okay. okay. God damn it, Dan. We're already starting up. You don't know what the fuck we're talking about. Welcome to It's a Mimic with your DMs, Adam, Dan, and Terry. All right, so listen, it's a little bit different. We did the giveaway from the second one. We actually had a shit ton of people write in. Uh, and at the very end of the episode, we're going to go, go through all the entries and then announce who the winner is. Was that a metric shit ton or an imperial shit ton? Because uh, we do have a lot of U.S. listeners. Uh, it, that was a metric shit ton. It okay. is a full double the imperial shit That's ton. That's 2. It, 2. 2. 2. 2. 2. 2. Yeah. 2. American shit tons. Yeah. Well, I, I think shit ton. I, it's, the imperial shit ton is actually called a presidential mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Can we, can we say that? Oh, <laughs> my God. Oh, that might be my favorite one. <laughs> All right, so. God damn, that was good. So we're done, right? Like, look at this. <laughs> That's the podcast. We're it's not great. It's all no, downhill man. from they here. They can't get us up here. They can't get us up here. What the <laughs> fuck? What are they going to do? Gonna build do? a wall? Are they gonna... <laughs> oh, shit. Dan. So, they can't send ice after us. We already have it in Canada. Oh, fuck. my God. So, anyway, here's here's what we have I'm going, going on today. To UK. <laughs> <laughs> it's just as bad there. Here's what yeah. we have going on today. It's another mailbag episode, so I've got the three lists of 20 uh, questions on each. We're going to roll. We have a black die, a white die, and a red die, and we're going to roll them, and it'll determine which one of these that we're going to hit. If you land on something you've already hit, then um, we're just going to re-roll until we get something new. Sure. Okay. We're only going to do 20 questions all the way through, so we're going to hit a third of the possible questions in front of us. But here's the deal. The white die right now is all questions from the same person. Who's that person? Another, or sorry, Alexander, another Skip Davis. Um, he was the one that gave us the Nawoni and Ghoul question. Okay. Yeah. He yes, the first mailbag. That's, that's right. He and I have been talking a lot. He's actually, uh, he plays earlier editions of D&D as well. Um, I want to say, I want to say first edition. He's old school with this. Not even AD&D? Uh, um, maybe first edition AD&D. Okay. But, um, Rolling he's, with the Thatco. I love it. He's, uh, he has given me tons and tons and tons of questions. And I'm like, hey, you know what? I was going to make this part of the mailbag episode and give me another four so we can fill up a table. So, <laughs> What did you say? Rolling with? Rolling with Thacko. Do you not know what Thacko is, I Harry? thought you said Thotco, and I almost repeated you. No, no. Thacko. Thacko. Uh, so AC in... Uh, a, D, and D, and whatnot was inverted. So the lower your Thacko score, which was your two hit, two hit AC zero. Yeah. So they ha- you had to roll low on the D twenty to hit someone. Okay. All right. Yeah. Mm, fine. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he is, he gave us a bunch of stuff in here. We also have a whole bunch of other questions um, from other people, older questions as well that we never got to, as well as some newer questions. So I had a lot of fun putting this together. I think, Terry, you DM'd the first one. Dan, you DM'd the second mailbag episode. I think so, yeah. So, it's my turn, bitches. So, by divine right, I should go again. Um, <laughs> no. Okay. No. Wait, what's that What's that rule in it's... England about the, the king's right? Whatever we want, we just take it. <laughs> <laughs> Not what I meant, but I guess the same thing. So, uh, we're going to take turns rolling dice. I'm going to go first, and we're going to roll through it. If there's a specific question for a specific person, for example, Terry... How do you shake that ass so nicely? Terry, you can answer that. <laughs> Dan, you can jump in if you'd like. Okay. But we'll let whoever the question's geared it's to. All Dan, in the hips. how do you shake my ass so nicely? It's all in the hips. <laughs> all right. Well, it comes from a previous career, if you can call it that. So, anyway. So, um, just to kind of give you guys an idea, um, red are newer questions, black are older questions, and white are Alexander and other Skip Davis questions. Okay. All right. So, you can choose which die you'd like. I'm going to go first. And I'm going to start with white, because I've been looking forward to this. Okay. Uh, what did I roll? 14. 14. He asks, what was the scariest time in an RPG? Oh. Well, how do, who answers? Do you, um, you decide? Yeah, I, I decide. Dan, you go first. Dan. Uh, so the first time I legitimately got scared in an RPG, I think I was maybe 15 years old. And uh, me and my buddies were playing uh, old... I, it was a module. I forget which one it was from uh, way back in the day. But uh, the DM went hog... It was our Halloween session. And he went hog wild. He uh, decorated up the room, dropped the lights, threw on the candles, threw in the ambient music. And then we did like... 
different kind of ambient music, and we uh, we did a zombie like mummy themed thing, and there was like jump scares and everything else, and. I had to stay the night at his place that night because there was no way in hell I was hopping on my bike and riding home at 2 o'clock in the morning. How old were you? Session. About 15. 32. Okay. Terry, what was, what was the scariest thing in a D&D session? In a D&D RPG, I'm reminded... I'm, I don't know if this is even the correct answer. It's just the one that came to head. I remember, Adam, when you were DMing for our group and there was a situation where our goblin child NPC had been snatched from behind us and we didn't realize, but at the same time, we were we were actually... Half the party was halfway through a portal to save um, an orphanage, as often it is, that was in imminent threat. And all of the orphans were going to be killed. And we were essentially portaling in there to save them. But our child NPC had been snatched from behind us. And we knew it was, do you save the orphans or do you save the NPC that you got attached to? And it was one of those times where it's like the whole player meta thing where it's like, we know the needs of the many uh, we're the needs of the few but we are so attached to this NPC do you guys remember that you split the party there were six of you around the table yeah you guys split the party and it was not good no that, that was the end of the of that campaign and I believe That's I like, went yeah. in the direction to save the orphans I think to yeah. help our barbarian uh, um, so did my dragonborn for that yes session. Like, but yeah. me as a player I didn't want to I I wanted the NPC to survive I, but it's one of those things where it's like you understand the importance of what needs to be done and it's also, hey, play the game in that this is an important backstory for this player. I will help this player achieve their backstory. Goal. I like how we took, I, I believe we took a small break after that because people were getting very it was emotional at Oh, the there was, yeah, and just it's, it's stressful times. People get frustrated. It's understandable. We're humans. We're emotional. And we were getting frustrated at each other at the table. And we sit around at this podcast talking about, hey, you know, all these things about how to make it work and stuff. We were getting frustrated. People were getting mad uh, because that we were so Megan's split. That was Megan's first session, too. I'm amazed she came back to play with us ever it, again. And you know what? That was, that was scary because it was stressful because I just, you know, when you sit there and you look at it and you just cannot see the right answer. And yeah. I just could not figure it out. But we didn't have time. We had to act right now. Go. Okay. So, honestly, my answer is um, everyone will be able to hear it coming up. It's in the Call of Cthulhu game, but so no spoilers, so I'm not going to say that. We've announced that at this point, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, I think it's like next week the Call of Cthulhu game starts to drop. I'm not good at this whole recording in the past and then it comes out on a certain date and stuff. So I, I have sure. a calendar in my brain. It's next yeah. week, is it? Yeah, so the, uh, the other thing, uh, so I guess the answer that I could talk about is we did a Christmas episode, Terry, you'll remember this. It was before Dan joined our campaign. And oh, at, the good old days. Yeah. <laughs> hey. And uh, the thing that we had done was you guys fought Santa Claus and Rudolph. Yeah. And then at the very end, everybody got these chests thrown down. And I provided physical chests with dice in them for you guys. Oh, yeah. was the that before Dan? Oh, my goodness. Was yeah. that before Dan? Wow. Um, and... Uh, but the one that Jamie got was called, uh, it, instead of dice, it had a bunch of wooden blocks that spelled, it's a mimic, bitch, in it, right? <laughs> a and, foreshadowing. But he also was in darkness, and magical darkness, as he opened it up, and the mimic attacked him. And not only did the other play, did the other characters not know, the other players were playing with their new dice and didn't give a shit. It was... And Jamie, we Jamie, legit didn't give a fuck. I was so I was like, these dice are beautiful. I'm talking to the other players. It's the very end of like an eight hour session. Jamie is stressed because his barbarian is out of rages, and he had some some sorcerer levels, but he was out of spell slots, and he was down to like half his life. And this mimic just kept hitting him, and he couldn't see it, and he was disengaging and running away, and it would catch up every single time, and he was so fucked up by this mimic he got down to like single digit hit points jeez and he was level yep. nine eight he had went yeah, eight, eight hit points yeah he was level eight or nine he ended up at eight hit points and then finally he killed the mimic and found his dice inside of the mimic yeah but I legitimately thought that I was going to have an after thought Christmas uh, session murder a player character and I sat there as a dungeon master going oh my god what do I do this has gotten out of fucking control. It was so, well, funny to look back on, but not really at the time. Like, we legit, we weren't even listening. No. You were like He was DMing. so upset. You were DMing a full combat. We were talking about, you know, hey, mine it's Christmas sparkle. time like, yeah. and Mind Sparkle is the best thing ever. Thanks, thanks, Adam, the best DM ever. Who wants snacks? Pizza's here. And Jamie's like, like guys, guys, I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty Bless good. him. 
Anyway, yeah. Hi, Jamie. Anyway, um, let's see. Uh, Dan, Dan, go next. Okay. Cool. Um, I. I said pause, but what pause because he was still saying his sentence. Okay. Uh, so I think I'm gonna go with the red one. Red's always best. Goes faster. Right. Okay. 17. Ooh, 17. I'm going to read them out because I want to read. Okay. At dice underscore cats. Dice cats. Ooh, dice cats. That's the one with the cats that hit the mm. dice. Yeah. Um, I love... My, no, funny enough, my children love that channel. Uh, like, they are constantly asking me to uh, play the Instagram videos with the cats I'm and the often dice. unsure of both dice and cats, so I'm skeptical. I am unsure of children. Um... Dice Cat says, All my games have someone inspired by Al Swearingen from Deadwood. What fictional characters or real people were the inspirations for NPCs in your games? Ooh. Ooh. So, I, I guess this is... This is you. This is me. Okay, you get so... You to choose who answers the question, I believe. No, you do. Sorry. I do, yeah. Sorry, Adam. Um, so, I have recently rolled up a... Uh, I was told to roll up a uh, monk... Or, sorry, a fourth level evil character. Which... Race was this character, Dan? He was a Minotaur. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> those, I was waiting for it. Those regular listeners will know why I was already mad when I asked him which He race. was a uh, Minotaur. He was a half Minotaur. Okay. No, no. So he was a Minotaur. Uh, so we were told to roll level four evil characters. I rolled a Minotaur Monk of the Long Death with a little sprinkling of Cleric of uh, d- with the Death Domain in it. It's a very Kung Fu Panda. Uh, no, no. Guy. So the way I uh, made this guy is I, I built him off of the six-fingered hand as an inspiration from Princess Bride. This guy is fascinated with death and specifically age. So he is sitting there and he, uh, being an evil campaign, he wants to witness the and record the moment a soul leaves a body and uh, uh, twists all that. So you, you remember those scenes of Princess Bride where he's uh, torturing... Wesley in or whatever the I forget his name I think it's Wesley uh, where he's torching the guy in the rack and uh, he's like and that was another year and that was another year this is the kind of like uh, quiet methodical intelligent uh, but absolutely malevolent uh, I feel like I would like this character yeah I I was super I was super pumped for it Um, the way I did it is he was the guard for the library for these monks that their entire focus is uh, death and life and stuff like that. So I I pulled from Princess Bride for this character, who is a minotaur monk. Like, it l- leads itself into a big, yeah. beefy meat house. So, yeah. Terry? Uh, for me, and what was the question? My favorite? Or where have, <laughs> I taken in, where have I taken inspiration from for player characters? I took my... One of my more recent characters was... Um, a half elf rogue who I kind of modeled on like a Victorian gentleman, bit of a bit of a g- gambler sort of type, and I modeled it on um, uh, Jedediah Shine from the Ripper Street series. Um, if you guys have ever seen Ripper Street, is phenomenal series. It's very dark and gritty, and he's like a crooked um, detective cop in uh, in uh, Victorian London, right after the Jack the Ripper murders. That's what I thought I was basing it on. But there was like some heavy gambit themes on. Well, that guy. but I didn't realize even when Adam we talked about before on the podcast gave me a deck of cards that do things such as Gambit's deck of cards and I think it was just a few episodes ago you guys said well he was Gambit and I realization in real time on that podcast went oh shit he was Gambit (laughs) but I modeled him on Jedediah Shine from Ripper Street and Ripper Street is a really gritty series I love it it's uh, it's really really good but yeah he was that was probably my favorite inspiration that took for a character what about you Adam so um, the question was specifically NPCs and neither of you did that but Mm. um, so (laughs) so here's what I do is I played enough D&D that I have kind of a backlog of, of what other players have created like you Dan you've got your Lockie character your gnome investigator who's really fleshed out right yeah. and um, I and Terry you had uh, your Captain Hawkridge mm-hmm. character who had an incredible emotional journey that you played him through oh you broke him oh absolutely yeah. and, but he rebuilt he had a wife and a kid and things by the end of that campaign he was bordering on evil he was definitely neutral in his approach to things yeah for well awful good. I've included both of them now in another campaign that I'm running with someone who wasn't at the table right mm-hmm. so yeah. um, so they've she's never met either of these characters before but they're both there in their their heyday Lockie is at the most um 
drug addicted. Oh, uh, good. Um, sarcastic. What's the point of life? But we've got a job to do. Um, like perspective on life. And ca- Captain Titus Hawkridge Captain is Titus. reporting for duty. And and he's he's the palace guard as well. But he's like the face for the party. Yeah. To to interact with. So I grab old player characters. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And I and I kind of. Drop them into an other world, alternate dimension, right? And, and to be completely honest, that's a great thing for if you are a multiple time DM with the same group of players around a table and you've run a few campaigns, do that with your players and twist it in certain ways so that your players around the table slowly start to realize who it is they're talking to and then they get really excited. Ninety percent of the time, but but the, but no, but the thing that I do is I don't bring old characters in because when the campaign is done and one of your characters either lived or died and happily ever after, they're done. This is a multiverse. This is a different version of this character yeah, under yeah. different circumstances. If it's the same world, don't do this. But yeah. if it, if it's a yeah. different world, different uh, campaign setting, do it because right. I want to, or even a different time period. Yeah, I just want to honor these characters and see what else they have to offer. Yeah. So, Anyways, that, that's my answer. Um, Terry, do you want to roll a die? Sure. Um, I will roll... Where are those new ones? Red ones? Uh, yes. Sure. I'll roll a new one. Three. Rackham. Trois. Oh. Jackie Rackham. This is going to be good. My bestie. Says, Love if you girl. had a choice, which non-nerd-related movie or show would you turn into a modular system? Oh. No Tolkien... No George R. R. Martin. She said non-nerd related, though. And both of those are nerd related. Yeah, but she was very specific. Neither of those. Okay. So non-related movie or show would you turn into a modular So it could be system. nerdy, but not D&D related. No, she not- says non-nerd related movie or show. Non-nerd related movie or show? Well, Rackham, you're making it hard there because... Everything is nerdy Everything these days. is nerdy. Um... Uh, non-nerd related well do you know what actually because it isn't really nerd related and I just used it earlier but I'll say it again I would say Ripper Street and we've already uh, talked about the fact that we played the Call of Cthulhu game and I was constantly thinking about a Jack the Ripper type Call of Cthulhu game Um, you know maybe either exaggerating certain details or twisting certain details Having a little bit of a, like a Sherlock Holmes sort of twist on it, but very gritty, very dark. That threat of death being there uh, constantly, the mind twisting insanity of it. But uh, Ripper Street's a fantastic series, and I would, I would do something like that. Yeah. Cool. Dan, oh, I'm I'm sitting here thinking like, I would love to do like a, uh, I don't know if it's 28 Days Later or if it's the Left Behind series, but that feeling of uh, isolation. Your characters wake up after having been either jailed or knocked unconscious or something and there is nobody anywhere around and you are in an extremely heavily populist city and you are just trying to figure out what happened to everybody like that's what I would do for yeah. like uh, maybe it's a four session arc because of course eventually being the only ones around is going to run dry it's so funny that you didn't say walking dead because that's how Episode one. I, I wanted to go away from Walking Dead because then that leads into zombies. I would actually lead away from zombies here. I would go like. So Twenty eight days later. That's why I said or left behind where I went. It's God did it, but uh, it's the it's the feeling of isolation. I'd go away from zombies and maybe do like mass uh, kidnapping or go mind flayer and it would be uh, alien abduction abduction abductions. Why is that word so hard to say? Alien abductions. Yeah, okay. No, I, I like that. I like it. Honestly, I've got a thousand answers, but they're all nerd-related. So I'm just going to say this. How often do you walk into a tavern in a small town where there's just a whole bunch of simple farming folk and you don't run a fucking western? Yeah. Why are we not doing westerns? Why are we not doing westerns? The, the entire genre is blown wide open. So I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily do True Grit, but The Magnificent Seven... That is literally about a party coming together to fight the guys in the town. Yeah. yeah. Right? That's what your low-level party should be. Right? So, The Magnificent Seven would be my answer. Right? Yeah. Um, oh, you could do, um, just talking about that, you could go, because you said Magnificent Seven made me think of the Hateful Eight. You could do a one-shot where you're trapped in the tavern. Yeah. No well, kinds of shit's going wrong. Right? Or you could do the good, bad, and the ugly, much like this contest, or this contest, much like this, uh, this podcast. Oh, I'm the good one. 
Damn it. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's a given that you're the bad one. Uh, yeah. 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 So, Thanks, Rackham. Fuck. Thanks, Rackham, for calling Dan ugly. A thumb with a face. All right, I'm going to roll uh, another one of these white ones. Uh, I, I rolled the same one I got the first time. Wow, one in 20 chance. Yeah. Um, so what are the odds? Well, nine. Annoying. Uh, what, uh, so this is another Alexander, another Skip Davis, asks, what are the top three tabletop role-playing games, in your opinion, besides 5th edition? Ooh. Ooh, God. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Dan, you, you can roll. I don't have another, to, like, three. We don't have nine to discuss between us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so you, well, Dan, you throw some out, and I'll throw an extra one in. Yeah. If it's you miss something that I like. Um... I really like GURPS. I've always, I've always really Sorry, liked. What is it? What is GURPS? GURPS. Uh, GURPS is a older. Uh, is that the name fa- of it? GURPS or is that an acronym? Uh, it's an acronym. I don't know what it means, off the top of my head. But what it is is a very free form uh, version of role playing that really lets your players get up to all sorts of shenanigans. It's basically one of those things. If anything you could do, you could do in GURPS. Um, there is a uh, um, like superhero rule set. There's a other things that just build onto it, and that's it's a very loose form. GURPS is not even a a tabletop role playing game. It is just a rule set. The way that the D twenty is a rule set, or it and it stands for Generic Universal Role Playing System. Yep. Yep. So it's not even a it's not even a game. It's just like it, rules. it's incredibly. Uh, uh, open so, but you could just tell a story. You could just, would, uh, yeah, yeah. People will just, yeah, pretty much. I thought you wouldn't say Vampire the Masquerade. My second one, I would probably say, <laughs> is uh, the Call of Cthulhu. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> um, it was great. It was, it was really good. It, no, it, I'm stoked. Yeah, to hear it again. Um, we definitely um, did our own spin on it, but it was it was really really fun. It's it's far more deadly than than I think anyone oh, at the table I really expected. It, it, intern so. Dave actually said that he prefers it to Dungeons and Dragons rule sets. There's uh, there is things That's that I fun. do prefer. There's things <laughs> I don't prefer, but yeah. uh, we discussed that on the podcast anyway with yeah. the the Call of Cthulhu series. Um, but I also thoroughly enjoy. We mentioned it before, I think off mic, but Shadowrun. Um, I do like Shadowrun. Um, it's a great system. It's a great uh, now. Is that the cyberpunk setting. one? Or? It's the cyberpunk one. Would, it's it's D and D in the that. distant future. All of your dragons are still dragons, but they are humanoid form running massive corporations that are trying to undermine uh, your dwarves, your elves. Your Shadowrun everything. just sounds like a '90s Saturday morning cartoon. Where like they were all you need to play a to good Shadowrun but, campaign. But I've it, played a few, and they it like, sounds like it's it's futuristic gargoyles or futuristic Futuristic Batman the Animated Series. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, right? it's Batman, got, Batman it's, of the Future. It's got a little Batman bit Beyond. Of that, Batman Beyond. Batman yeah, Beyond. It's got Sorry, a little nerds. bit of that feel to it, yeah, but it's it's unique and it's fantastic and it's got just enough fantasy to really uh, attract people like me who live in the fantasy world. And then I will also throw on the entire White Wolf product line of Vampire the Masquerade, Mage the Hunt, uh, like all of those other ones, uh, Werewolf, all of them all together as one massive system. It's great. I love the way that they do skills. I love uh, how it's the D10 system. Everything's just stacking D10s. I love the fact... uh, I played a Malkavian back in the day, so I, I loved playing the kind of crazy guy who based on his bloodline very innately has some insanities to him back in my edgelord days it was great to have those kind of things so i like the vampire system i love the Shadowrun system gurps is very free and open and good for people to use and um i really do like call call of cthulhu uh over top of all of it so you know I, i gotta say i mean do you have any terry I mean, I'm not going to say anything that's different to Dan. I just want to put my own point on Call of Cthulhu if I can. Because the reason I like Call of Cthulhu is, yes, originally it comes from this 1920s sort of era. But it can be adapted to anything. And it is very, even though it is fantastical in its own ways, it can be made very realistic in that you are very vulnerable. But you're using modern day technologies and things that you're somewhat familiar with, whether it be 20s, the the noughties, whatever you're going to do, even a little bit of sci-fi. And so uh, you can get much more immersed in it in the sense that you are vulnerable and you're making real decisions based on how you do things. You're not not a hero. 
You oh, are no. just a spectator that You're needs to we get out of often during yeah. the game. We're just trying to survive this thing. Yeah. You know, we're They're, literally trying to get away. We're not trying to take the dragon head on. We're like, I'm noping the fuck out of here. Because of my love for all things medieval, there is a medieval supplement for Call of Cthulhu where you could like roll a knight and you have swords and everything else. Still sword and sorcery, but it's with like the Call of Cthulhu level of. Danger. I imagine it would be very Westeros, like where you are weak. Yeah, you right? are weak, and it like you can be changed. a main character yeah. and you will die of syphilis. Like yeah. it's all right. So, so here's here's my answer, and my answer is going to be um, Dungeons and Dragons, because he specifically says Fifth Edition. Now there are really three different, uh, four different types of D and D. Right? There's Fifth Ed, which I mean, everyone listening to this is probably playing, except for. Alexander and other Skip Davis. Yeah. Right. But um, the AD&D system is so radically different mechanically, and it's fantastic. And there are people that are still playing it 40 years later after it came out because it's so good. I personally know two different tables that are still running 3.5 because it was so immersive in the rule set. So once you learn them, you don't want to leave and you can do anything. You want to be a superhero? Be a superhero. Yeah, and I, you know, I gotta say, Pathfinder for, scratched that itch too. Like, uh, I, I have my, nothing. My, I have nothing good to say about Pathfinder. Really? Yeah, I yeah. have nothing good to say about Pathfinder. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Our table before Fifth Edition came out, um, we played Pathfinder for five years, four years, however long that gap yeah. was. Yeah, I don't know why you would play it when you have perfectly good three point five. Uh, 3.5 suffered a lot of bloat, and they did uh, streamline a lot of the rules that were broken in three Pathfinder. Has a lot of bloat. Now that, that's why yes. they got the second version coming out, second edition. Which, but, which in and of itself is also a fantastic. But, set that but I, I would say, sorry, no, 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 no. I'm not. This is not a Pathfinder apologist podcast, Dan. You had your turn. Shut up. I'm DM. So, <laughs> so fourth edition gets a lot of hate. Yeah, because fuck that shit. <laughs> but I think that if you knew what you were getting into and it didn't say Dungeons and Dragons on the on the cover of the book, it would have been accepted just fine. Um, as, yeah. as its rule set, it had deeper lore in a lot of ways than we were given. Um, like we got the Raven Queen out of it, right? Um, but it also had its own different kind of way that spells and powers and mechanics worked, and it was very balanced. A fighter didn't have to hit; a fighter had options. And I know a lot of people came off from Fourth Edition and the Fifth Edition and went, "Oh, the fighter got dumbed down again," right? And I don't know. I think there's some good things in Fourth Ed. So yeah. um, I don't know. I think that D and D has covered a lot of it. The one thing that we haven't mentioned. I'm sorry about cutting you off about Pathfinder, Dan. I can see you pouting over there. Oh, I'm not pouting about it. I just I, I he's plotting revenge. If anything. <laughs> so the way I view it is, uh, Fifth Edition is very freeform storytelling focus, whereas Pathfinder is very much a building a character that is unique and individualistic. Like I I, I really like. The, it's a different focus, so you get into Pathfinder 2 and everything is modifiable. The big complaints I've got from a lot of people about 5th edition is in terms of variations to their characters, there's very little that they could pick and choose, especially level to level. Pathfinder focused on a, at every level you get better, you get a you get something at every level and you get to modify whatever the hell you want on your character. There's alternate traits. And, and, that, and that Some is people don't like it. Some people do. And I think if you're building characters and you like doing a lot of theory crafting and character building and stuff like that, which is an entire world around this game that we don't really cover a lot of here, um, Pathfinder and the new Pathfinder 2 that's coming out are fantastic places to go for this. I just think that Dungeons and Dragons is about storytelling and Pathfinder is about min-maxing. And if I want to min-max, I'll play a Final Fantasy game. And that's it. Like, that's my perspective on it. I get why people play it. It's not for me. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's fair enough. Um, the one... Uh, look, if, yeah, you, if you want to be a superhero that, that levels and is totally unique, play... What is it? Uh, mutants and Masterminds. I was going to say Mutants and Masochists. I'm glad you said Mutants and Masterminds. I'm listening. So... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's something that we haven't explored, and I would really like to explore that in the future. <laughs> Matt, speak for yourself, Adam. <laughs> Dan? I don't know why I said you. Oh, uh, no, it's because my turn to roll. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no one's rolled on black die yet, so I'm going to do that. Do it. Nine. That is a nine. Uh, Matthew Easterling. This pisses me off because it looks like Matt the Weasterling, but it's Matthew Easterling. Right. I, okay, first of all, yeah. Matthew, get a grip of your handle. 
Okay, that does look like Matt the Weasterling. <laughs> uh, it, Matt the Weasterling. I love you, Matt. You're yeah, good. Uh, asks, any advice on running an adventure in the Feywild? Guess what, Matt? We have a Feywild episode. We do. Also, Matt the Weasterling would be a perfect name for an NPC who is in the Feywild, so yeah. you're, we're running with it now. <laughs> yeah. Are you from the West or the East? Yes. I am the Weasterling. I am the Weasterling. I am the Weasterling. <laughs> you know what? I'm putting that in a campaign now. That's canon. You are now going to be a character in our campaign. Didn't I meet you? You must have been speaking to the Easterling. <laughs> <laughs> Terry? Uh, what was the fucking question? <laughs> Roll a die. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry. No, seriously. We got it. We got the Feywild episode. Give that a listen. Uh, black ones are, black ones are old ones, right? Yep. yep. Uh, 19. 19. D&D Coalition. Hey, asks, Cam. What got, What is your guy's most popular channel? Ooh. Um, most popular channel for uh, for the podcast? Uh, iTunes and Spotify are pretty close. Yeah. I, 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 I would top my head which one's better. I'm sorry. I don't, is it iTunes is the most popular channel? I, yeah, iTunes we get uh, we get quite a lot more from. Yeah, we're, I always we're, thought it was We're on tons of different, different platforms and whatnot through Podbean. Um, but I was scrolling those... through the Podbean list is kind of humorous because there's like 20 different catchers mm-hmm. that it lists out. Um, Apple is heads and shoulders above the rest. Spotify is also that was a real there. test from Cam there to throw that out at me. What's your most popular channel? Oh shit! And, 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 and I'm looking at Dan going and I choose Spotify, <laughs> iTunes definitely. Yeah, I'm 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 the, I'm the numbers nerd that just sits there and looks at uh, our downloads and how we're doing, which we're doing pretty good right now. Look, I, I'm gonna look for those of you that are listening. All like seven of you that tuned into the mailbag episodes. <laughs> um, I would love to get the YouTube channel up and running because if we can get some real traction on YouTube, then I want to swap to video sometime in the next few months. What kind of videos do you want to see is what I want to ask the world. Nude. That's no, it. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Right, it's my turn to roll this the die. Because Adam's the only one that can do this, actually, because... Okay, look. Adam, you, 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 you may not know this about me, but ladies, it, <laughs> you may not know this about me, but occasionally I'll say the odd thing, which I know is outrageous to some people, because it is very fun for me to watch Dan react. Adam is the only person that can say something that truly like shuts me up because he says it out of nowhere, and I look at him and I'm like, I don't know how I fucking react to that, <laughs> and I shouldn't want to react to that. All, All right, right, sure, wang out, why not? Yep. Yeah, All right, I'm rolling. Because uh, no I'm one else, I'm fairly certain that's against YouTube's TOS. <laughs> no one else is rolling on uh, on another Skip Davis. Well, we have so two goes. Well, I'm, I'm going again. Um, it's literally a third of the thing. So uh, number four, who mentored you first or best into being as good of a DM as possible? Hmm. Dan. Oh, I, I'm going first again. Okay. Uh, no, huge shout out to my buddy Nick. Uh, Nick is the guy who got me into Dungeons and Dragons. Um, Way back when I was eight years old, um, he's still a regular member of my Friday night group, which is all of my old high school buddies. We all get together and we play, um, and some of my buddies post high school are now part of that group. Uh, he ran a very uh, logical, systematic, organized way, and he kind of showed me what, um, how he run, how to run a campaign efficiently. And then um, I don't want to do it because it will go to his head. But uh, I have had another DM recently who's really pulled me into the how to run a table and role playing and um, how to run a very intriguing storylines and character driven storylines. Um... <laughs> Fuck off, Terry. <laughs> what? I missed that. I was reading the questions. I was what? what? I look over and Terry's deep throating his fucking beer bottle, <laughs> <laughs> like slowly making eye contact and establishing and, and dominance. I, I deep throated a, a microphone in the freaking Green Dragons episode. So you're next, Dan. Yeah, that's called the North Yorkshire choke. No, because I actually have something called fucking dignity. Um, the fucking dignity. <laughs> okay, go on, go on, go on. No, not seriously, Adam. Uh, playing in your campaign really uh, brought that love for heavy role playing um heavy uh character driven narratives uh into my games and it it really gave me a step up in there i mean and you could always point to like the matt mercers and the matt Covels of the world who really um have informed my dming process hmm. oh, th- thank yeah. you terry what's <laughs> Adam's gonna get double bump here. Actually, I, and chap- you started DMing before you met either of us. So. Uh, no, but this is—I'm gonna say where I learned some very important things uh, during DMing. And I learned 
from maybe boringly so, but maybe not from both of you for different reasons. Hey, we should start a podcast. We should. Hey guys, we should start a podcast. <laughs> I'll tell you what I, what I learned a lot from Adam was Adam taught me to not feel like I have to constantly have a monkey brain. That's what I'm like. I'm like pop, pop, pop. I'm like reacting to things constantly. I stand up when I'm DMing, and I'm, it's constantly like not like I'm at war with the players, but I'm like. I used to be like on edge to react to whatever they were going to do. Adam told me that you don't need to have a plan for everything. You just need to have eventualities in place or at least know where certain things are at certain times mm -hmm. and then have some ways to deal with certain situations. You lean a lot into random tables. Yeah. And they're phenomenal. You do them for uh, for crit tables for when we get crit hits, crit failures. You do them for uh, travel on the road. And that taught me to be very loose because I already know these scenarios. They're just in my back pocket for if I need them. So I don't need that monkey brain to be on the table. Um, Dan, you taught me that I can DM a system that I'm not familiar with when you GM'd Call of Cthulhu uh, impeccably well. You weren't too familiar with that system. No, no, no. But you took the principles from your Dungeons and Dragons playing with regards to exploration, role play, how you describe and put the story across. You taught me that all I need to do is just learn a few basic rules, but still be flexible in my delivery, and that I can cr transition to other games quite easily and to not be afraid of them. Learn a few basic rules, but really don't rely on a few basic phrases because your your players will rally against you every time you say the words in a heap, baleful howl, or what are the other ones? Viscera. Viscera. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which comes up quite a lot in our games. It does, yeah. So, does. Uh, so Call of Cthulhu drinking game, when we release our new thing, every time oh, the fans Don't do this, says, it, you'll get absolutely Hosed. Rack him. Play Call of Cthulhu drinking game. Every, Every time, time that Dan says baleful, how? Anytime anyone says the word baleful or, or someone says viscera, you have to take a shot. Or in a heap. Or in a heap. Yeah. 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 All right. So um, I guess my answer is I'm going to go way back in the day. I got a buddy, Brad, not the same Brad that was on episode 30. Um, and he was 10 years older than me, 11 years maybe. Uh, when oh, I man, started. Brad. Yep. Yeah. When I started playing, he is. Um, He's a guru as far as knowing the rules in 3.5. He just knew everything. The man was an encyclopedia. But he had such a passion about character creation. And our D&D &D sessions would often break down into, is that the most optimized way to do that? Can we build the math better? And uh, like, I, like, I like math. I like spreadsheets and tables and having the answers and knowing the equation. And so he dragged me in with that. And that was a huge inspiration for me for years. And then I sat down at Terry's table. And Terry listened to the players instead of talking to them. And there's a difference. And my DM styling style now is more about listening and agreeing and going along with it. Because when we sat down at your table and you were DMing, Terry, you didn't have any prep for this. Wait, well, we're doing Curse of Strahd and the DM backed out. Are you good to go next week? Yeah, that's and you, how it went. And you took it on and you had you DM'd for like... Uh, one person one shots in the past I mean but I, this was I kick myself now looking back at some stupid mistakes and obvious things I'd do it better but yeah it was on short notice <laughs> but you sat there and, and you said you would read the thing out of the module and say and then you hear this screeching wail from whatever and, and I would turn around and be like so would you consider lungs to be an open container <laughs> and I didn't expect you to say yes because no that's stupid move on yeah. was what I was expecting. I thought it was a joke. Which it and, would be now, yeah, and, just but, so you know. <laughs> but you said, yes, why not? That's an interesting, fun way to move forward. And then when I started drowning a guy with my Create Water spell, drowning a guy on, on, on dry land. Which, by the way, I still think they need to look at that spell again because, <laughs> yeah, lungs is an open container. If I pull your lungs out of your body, that's an open container. Yeah, yeah <laughs> they're, they're a bag of limited holding. Yeah. So, <laughs> but... <laughs> But the, uh, it taught me how to listen. Yeah. Right? Because there were players around the table, and you were more concerned with, is everyone having a good time, than is my story um, being honored, and are the mechanics correct? Right. And so it became about storytelling, and it became collaborative. Yeah. And that's, that was the thing that changed, that changed how it worked for me. Back when we were doing that demon keep thing for like seven weeks, it was all kick open the door and kill the demon. Kick open the door and kill the demon. Kick open the door and kill the demon. And all the role playing and exploration was done in midweek content through emails and Facebook chats and whatnot. And we would get to the table and it was all tactical, tactical, tactical. And I went, this isn't fun. We're just stressed out and managing resources. What did I lose here? And what I lost was listening to the players. I designed the tactics 
but had given up on what the players wanted and needed and just said, this is a good, interesting encounter. We haven't done a hallway. What if there are bugs on the ceiling? And that's as far as I went, and that was a failure of mine. So yeah. that's what I learned. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate you saying that. That's very kind. But also, I, you you could recognize where you... We can recognize where you recognize that something was going wrong. Because then, how much theater of the mind stuff did we start to do? How much exploration stuff did yeah. we start to do? Even if something was dungeon crawl esque, the maps weren't coming out till later. And, we, and you know, it's and that's what it's all about, right? It's learning and things. But but what you did there was perfect for somebody who's very tactically minded. But you know, for people who are not tactically minded, it doesn't work as well. But you're right. You yeah, you 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 recognize how it changed out, and that, and that was great. No, good. Then so our answers were each other. <laughs> <laughs> and Nick. Yeah. And Nick. Thanks, Nick. I'm rolling red four. Red four. Pepperina Sparkle Gem says, Dan, what the oh, fuck? Shit. I thought we were friends. What's this bullshit about our accents? Oh, shit. Oh, Dan? Um, they're super sexy and hot, and I really got a special spot in my heart for them. Um, you can tell and, by the way and, you're really selling and, that there. No, no, no. Well, you and married a girl I Ohio. literally married a girl from Ohio, so that is a legitimate statement. As much as I uh, you know, make fun of them for saying, you know, paper bag and whatnot. It's the, it like, is the weirdest fucking accent ever. It, it, is, it, is, it is absolutely No, no, New Zealand. Okay, also weird. Uh, well, I grew up only a couple of hours away from Glasgow, so that's weird <laughs> and, as well. And Wales. And Wales. <laughs> Everything we say sounds like we're singing. We're up and we're down and we're up and we're down. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Ohio just throws random letters in there. They just add a Y to every That's other. A, and 15 everything. L's. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, I actually do like the Midwest accent. I, I also, I have found through playing in our oh, yeah, DMD you, games. You also, hey, you also do your internet searches on Bing as well, don't you? Wink likes the Ohio accent. Sponsor us. Um, no. <laughs> No, the, the I would absolutely love to get sponsored by the state of Ohio. Yeah, <laughs> well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want that. I would love to product. get sponsored by the state of Ohio. That would be that would be a win in my book. No, it would Let's, not. The, okay, uh, what is it? Eight of the twenty people who have been, or thirteen of the twenty people who have been on the moon, have been from Ohio. People are literally leaving the planets to get away from that. I state. moon people all the time. This is perfect. There's a there's a synergy here. Yeah, yeah, yeah but that's because you missed your call as a plumber. Um, so the uh, do, 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 do. Hey, no, so <laughs> fucking nerds. Uh, we have found out that the uh, through our role playing around the table that I am really terrible at any sort of accent that involves going overseas for it from where we're currently at. I could rock this uh, Midwest accent. I could do the South, the Southern accent. I could, I could even pick out like Georgia or Texas or Florida. Like I, I could do that. I cannot differentiate between a Scottish, English, Cockney, you can't Irish accent, you, Jamaican, they're all the at same any you. point yeah. in time. You can differentiate between Scottish and English. I, I, I could say, that is a Scottish person, that is an English person. Yes, I cannot do it. My Scottish no. accent gets terrible. I'm not even going to do it on the podcast. Types of Scottish. You can do the Mrs. Doubtfire like this, but it's very kind of soft, and you can get much more fucking aggressive like this. You're from <laughs> they, they, call, they call it okay. Warvish. Okay, Jerry <laughs> Butler, it's your turn. <laughs> Jared, but don't give that man any accent to do. Have you seen Law Abiding Citizen or Have you PSI seen Have you, you seen 300 where he's playing a Greek? Like king, and he's yeah. still Scottish. P.S. I love you though. Like this Irish guy, I was like, just make him Scottish. He can't do anything else other than Scottish. <laughs> All right, Terry, you want to roll a die? Sure, I will roll. Gerard Butler, can you please sponsor us? Oh, no, Gerard I, Butler, okay, no, what, hey, honestly, Gerard Butler, we love you, man. I was watching, I like him. I was watching a video uh, interview that he did, and he's like, yeah, I don't know how I re- landed the role as the Phantom from Phantom of the Opera because when I landed the role, I could not sing, and I'm like. How do you get the role as the Phantom from the Phantom of the Opera? Is that a musical? Dan, I yes. don't want to... I'm kidding. I don't want to break it to you, and you know, people might not agree with me, but in Hollywood, if you are hot, you get whatever you want. Pretty much, so, yeah. I'll never experience that. I'm black is old. Thumb with the face. Black is old. Black is old. I'm going to go red is new, because I'm excited by new things. Well, red is the new black. Very clever. Uh, seven. That sounded sarcastic, but it wasn't. I was impressed. Uh, Nick Long... That's Nick Dot. Oh, me and Nick talk from time to time on Nick Instagram. Nick Dot underscore Dot Long. Yeah. Asks Terry, are the others as great and funny as you? Well, 
Now answer carefully, Terry. That's really up to you. One second while I grab this bottle and Please break it over the, the edge bottle. of the table. <laughs> Adam is funny in that he comes up with much more. He comes up with much more creative comebacks than me, and and tells and gives punchlines and jokes that well, I you only like one kind of comeback. Okay, see what I'm doing. Is that the big kind splash across your face? I, God damn, 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 damn. damn. Sorry. That's horrible. Dan. I meant sarcasm. There's there's women from Ohio that listen to this. Yeah, <laughs> Sexy into women it. from Ohio. Apparently. They're into it. Okay. <laughs> Adam usually comes back with much more creative comebacks and uh, don't do it. Come, and punchlines of me that I wouldn't be able to come up with off the top of my head. I'm very limited in the type of punchlines I tell. Go back and listen to them if you have the time or if you want to. You'll see that it's very limited. Dan is funny without. I'm like your target fun. market for all of your humor, by the way. Well, it's that's, like your your humor specifically shuts me down. Dan, I don't know how to say this. You're very easy to bully. Okay. <laughs> 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 that, that was not true, man. I just want no, to see your face. My, my, my history in high school would speak differently. No, that is very Dan, true. No. Dan, I'm on your side, man. Do you know what? Here's a, This is how much I love you, Dan. <laughs> you broke Adam. Here's how much I love you, Dan. If we were ever drunk outside of a bar and somebody was looking at you funny, I would deliberately start a fight just to fight on your in your corner. I would do that for you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Dan... It's funny without meaning to be funny, and in that he just does and says stupid shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if it's always meant to be funny, uh, the, but it the, is. Dan is stream of consciousness, and it is meant to be funny, but it just bubbles out of him. The best thing about Dan's sense of humor is the fact that he's hearing it for the first time. You know how you think it, and then you say, should I say this, yeah, yeah. and then you say it? Dan just... Dan, Dan just doesn't know where it's going. He just says it. <laughs> he he starts it. a sentence, it ends up somewhere funny, and then he laughs harder than anyone else. Yeah. Because it's funny to him. So, like, I really... No, that's not so, bad. So, no, 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 I just love you know, Dan. You're socially Dan. Awkward, you would be no, you no, 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 no. That's not because no. I firmly believe that you would be a phenomenal stand-up comedian if you did, did didn't write jokes. If you just went up and went, somebody give me a topic. So if I was George Lopez, if you just went up and did it, I'd laugh my fucking face off. <laughs> yeah, to be honest with you, <laughs> I want to sit down and listen to Dan start a story. God knows where the fuck we're gonna end up. Let's. Oh my God. <laughs> we were doing it earlier, Nick. We, Nick, we were prepping to record the episode and Adam was just sat, you can't see it, it's an audio medium, I'm pointing to something you can't see, just sat over in the corner, prepping the computer, prepping the programs and the mics and everything ready to go, and Dan was just waffling up, what the fuck are we even talking about? I don't even, even remember anymore. Even your wife was staring at you like, what are you talking about? And Dan was, Adam was like, we're on very, very limited time, please hurry up. This is what he does, he goes off on tangents, he's funny without meaning to be funny, Adam is more creative than I am. So there's your answer. But you have the delivery. Uh, yeah, I will deliver whatever you want me to deliver at a premium um, capacity. All right. Baby in an elevator? I'm baby. going... Hey, black guy. They, they never proved that baby was mine. 14. Uh, Dorian Mikulan asks, do you have a name for your favorite D20? I know and Dorian. And if so, on. what is the name of your favorite D20? Yeah. Dan, do you have one? Uh, yeah, it's uh, The Miserable Bastard, and I fucking hate that thing, although it is my longest-lived and favorite DM. Adam uh, said D20. favorite D20. Favorite D20. Favorite yeah, D20. yeah, it is my favorite D20. It's The Miserable Fucking Bastard, and I can't stand it. All but right. it's my favorite. I, I, oh. I keep on giving it chances, and it keeps on failing You me. should name it Rihanna, because it's like... If you really think about no, it... No, he should name it Chris Brown. He's Rihanna. Oh. <laughs> That's a better joke than mine. <laughs> That's a better joke than mine. What were you going to say? I was going to say because because Rihanna, because you don't fucking like her, but you would hate fuck her. You would... Okay, is this in a priest? It's too far. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a step over the line. Like, you don't like her, but you know you would. Okay. Terry, favorite T20? He said Chris Brown. Like, <laughs> no, <what> he <laughs> Fair enough. He was talking about beating fit. No, we can't say that. <laughs> so go on. Terry, We're favorite. not talking about beating face again. Favorite, favorite, favorite D20, D20 20. as uh, Stephanie. Stephanie. Yes, Dan. White five. Uh, Stephanie, because uh, named after Stephanie, who is the leader of the Pink Ladies in Grease 2, which is the better of the, the two Grease movies. And she quite often gives me a 19 or 20, so... There Which, go. when you're playing a champion fighter like you were with... Uh, yes, I was with Stephanie. My worst D20, and I'm going to say it, finally, is Greeny. Greeny? Yeah. Come on, Greeny's the original. Greeny did. Greeny was my OG D20, a forest green D20 that used to score so highly all the time. And then eventually I had to start singing a song... That would Come on, Greeny, don't fuck me or something. Well, I can't Come remember. on, Greeny, don't fuck me now. Come on, Greeny, don't fuck me. That's how it went, like that. And she always did. Do you know what she always rolled? Four. 
It was always four. Yeah. She always rolled fours. Yeah. yeah. I do have a new gold and green dice that is probably my mm. go-to dice now that I, I, I love the colors of. Uh, but it's I don't have a name for it. I don't name my dice because they all inevitably stab me in the back. And it's like picking a pet that you're going to eat eventually. Like Oh, that's going to bite you or something. Or that's going to bite you. Like if, if you're going out shopping for oh, that you. pig that's going to be a dinner or a turkey, you don't name the turkey. Oh, I do. Yeah, but I will name the lobster that I choose from the tank in the restaurant. Yeah. Yes, every time. And, and yeah. this is this is Mr. Clampy. Crack as yeah. you break its claw off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, was Mr. Clampy. Yes, that's, okay. What but, about you? Uh, no, I don't have a favorite D twenty. What I do at before every single time that I that I play D anD D is I grab four different dice sets and I line them all out from lightest to darkest in color. And then I will play for the first. We should have a conversation rain, about how you're not supposed to separate things like that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so all the d20s are together, all the d12s are together, and so on and so forth. And I will stick with one until it fails me, and then I will move on to the next one. And I will just cycle. Yep. that's it. And we, I always go from the darkest one to the lightest one, and then recycle all the way through it. And so that's it. The next week, I go. What am I feeling? I'm feeling blue spectrum today. We're going with blue dice. I love how even the biggest math nerd here. Still is superstitious when it comes to dice. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you, and you don't know, touch my dice. You know in your heart of hearts that that's not how probability works. Oh, no, I know. But but more importantly, when Mieka started playing over the summer, and she's like, well, you've got like 40 sets of dice. I'll just go, like, I'll just use one of yours. And I said that, and I went, no. <laughs> no. No, you won't. No, no you, you won't. won't. You will but not. But even, I mean, even out, I remember because I, I used to sit across from Jamie all the time. We sat on opposite ends of the table, and he would see me reach for my dice, and he'd be like, don't you dare pick Greeny. He would not let me choose that, that. Yeah. 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 No, it, my, my world came to a crashing halt in terms of my superstition with the game when I had children, and they go, oh, look, daddy's dice, and start me- Taking the dice and throwing them around the room, and then there's the like a D8 that's missing for three weeks, and then I finally find it, and and then my dice just treat me like crap. I'm literally having an anxiety attack right now with you talking about. I so ex- I had to. I have a box of just spare dice that I've just gathered over the years, and whenever I see my children reaching for my dice, my like my, my, my dice bag or my dice box that has all my dice. Are in, you talking about that clear bin of dice? I'm talking about the clear well, bin of well, dice. Well, you were. I I grab. My dice box, I hide it and I put the bin of just random BS dice in there. Because there while, was... while you were upstairs before we started recording yesterday, I had that and I dumped them all out. And they're, the D4s are at the bottom and then the D6s and then the D8s. So all the D20s are currently sitting at the top if we ever need one. We are so, so different. I actually, I actually went through and ordered them. Based. My children it would never even up. enter my mind. And so you have a problem with the room always reaching for daddy's dice? I have the same problem. Adam, go on. Uh, Dan, it is your time to roll a okay, D20. Okay, I'm going to roll a gray one. Except mine Or a white one. Five. Uh, five on the white table is Alexander, another Skip Davis, asks, what would you guys run at a convention? Honey, meet a dash. Ah, oh, that was the worst dad joke ever. That dad, you should have terrible You should have jumped joke. in on that one. That was really bad. Can you edit that out? No. I cut that out on the internet. I'm keeping that in. Okay. <laughs> Dan? Um, I'm actually looking into running, uh, 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 homebrew, but within the Taldori campaign. At, at, at a convention? At a convention, point? yeah. Um, everyone loves Critical Role, and they've got the Taldori campaign setting out there, so I'm currently reading through it, seeing what I could do, uh, run something out of there. Yeah, that's cool. Terry? Do you know what? Bit of a strange one. When I was a child, and I was in uh, primary school, which is like elementary school in the UK, uh, every Wednesday morning we used to split off and we used to go to different teachers and they'd read different books. And I always went to this one teacher, his name was Mr. Brown, and he would just um, pa- pass a dictionary around, a children's dictionary, and we would flick through the book, and it was like whatever this word... This person's my favorite person on the Listen, planet. <laughs> whatever, whatever word came up... Let's entertain would... all these six-year-olds. Let's flip to G. Yeah. Let's read the middle well, of G. Listen, and, and whatever word came up, he would just incorporate that word into the story. And I remember one time, like we were in, we were all penis. in the story and <laughs> well penis nuts in the children's dictionary oh, okay. Adam but it was like we were in the van and he was like okay next word and it was like adder like a snake and we opened the van and there was an adder in there and he would go like that I would legit just do that with adults at a convention just to show my storytelling like, you would run a like, D&D like, Mad Libs game I would just give them a children's dictionary pass it around the nerds let them open it up one at a time <laughs> and I would just tell them a story an inclusive story that they can help with there'd be no dice and I would just sit there and entertain adults at story time. When I'm putting my daughters to bed right now, we uh, they ask for a daddy story rather than a book. 
because they don't want me to read them a book. They want to help create the story. Because exactly. I'm slowly starting to get this idea of what creating your own narrative is like in, uh, in them. And I will tell the story and I'll be like, and the princess comes upon a... And wait for them to give... Prince. Her, well, <laughs> it's been things like... Um, a butterfly. Oh, a rock and roll butterfly. Okay, sure, we're doing a rock and roll butterfly. Oh, her left wing is blue. Sure, okay. Sure. And then I try to justify all this. It's a great exercise for a DM, but it's also tons of fun for a kid. Yeah. So, anyways, Adam? I'd run, a, ta- I'd run a, a booth, and I would honestly just talk to people. I think I'm going to do this at a convention. Whatever the next convention is, whether it's Fan Expo in Vancouver or Gen Con or whatever the thing that we go do, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking about running a booth where I can interview players because everybody wants to talk about their, their D&D experience, and nobody wants to listen to it. Mm-hmm. And that's what I would run at, at a convention. Like a D&D Come. confession booth. Yeah, You'll yeah. just Pretty sit much. on the other side of the, uh, of the yeah. wall and just listen. And I'm gonna Forgive me, DM, for I have sinned. <laughs> and you listen about my character. <laughs> Fuck, all right, go. <laughs> no, but what I would do is I would say, all right, what, what race, class, level, background were you? Give me the overarching storyline. What was one interesting quirk? And now roll three D20s. We're going to pull it off a random table with the questions that I'm going to ask you about this character. And then videotape it. Let them do this, and then I'll release it all on freaking YouTube because people love to know about D and D stories, and they need to see the regular people are doing it. Sure, yeah. right. So that's I don't know. What are you? Is are the people at home interested in this? I don't know. Write to us. Let us know. Yeah. Would you be interested in showing up and taking five minutes out of your convention time to talk to a random DM about? about I know for a fact the Pratts are like on it. They're there. They're ready for us. Chris Pratt? No, no. no. The, the, Friends of ours. Yeah, the people that we know. So, um, anyway, the whose turn was it, Dan? Was that... that it's Terry's turn now. Terry's turn. Ooh. I like new things. So one red. 17. Red 17. We've done it. That was okay. Dice Cats. Think... Give me another one. Red 15. 15. 15. Ah, at Monster Adventure Terrain, that's all one word. Hello. Asks for an episode on how to rule or role play skill checks that aren't pass-fail. Oh, like uh, like a scaling type system. Basically, yeah. Well, we've talked about this previously, but I think, yeah, this person is right that we can maybe go a little bit deeper into it about how, Adam, you typically have a scaling system about how well you pass. Whether or not if you're trying to get over the wall, if you fail, okay, maybe you do get on top of the wall, but you lose your movement, whatever. Like different ways that we can scale it. Yes, I think we can incorporate that into an episode at some point. Yeah. I I'd, I'd want to think of a way to use the skill challenge system for uh, investigating uh Mysteries and like uh, no 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 it's not a skill challenge it's skill checks that aren't simply pass fail what's I know. the gray area for skill checks okay um yeah I think so yeah. and I think we should also Before actually we in, as part of that episode we should just start to incorporate um, the skill checks that are not commonly done and how to properly incorporate them into the game yeah you know we do yeah. perception checks and that. all the time but sure yeah great question and uh, we're definitely thinking about it we'll do it I'm gonna roll it's white it's white. Not- uh, white seven is uh, which of the three stooges would you be and why? Me? Yep. Can I tell you something, guys? Well, Dan's the bald one. His um, name's Curly. In, <laughs> in the United Kingdom where I grew up, we did not have the three stooges. So I don't know. So he's Larry in your mouth. So my answer to this question is Mr. Bean. Adam is Mo. I yeah, like but that. you're like looking that. at me as though I know what you're talking about. Adam is Mo, you're Larry, I'm Curly. Is that what it is? Yeah. I'm Will Sasso. That, 100%. Yeah, no, that would be me. Will Sasso was Curly. I don't know the answer to this. I don't know these people. So, so... Uh, Mr. Bean. Sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm Black Adder. No, you'd be Black Adder. Oh, good show, though. I'd be Podrick. Damn it. <laughs> I feel like Terry's I'm faulty from powers. Red Dwarf. I feel no. I feel like yeah. Dan which, is Red which Dwarf. Which character from Red Dwarf? Basil and Sybil Faulty was loosely what Titus and uh, Kogu was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, I, was, I was very aware. Of yeah, it. yeah, yeah. So, uh, no, that's a good question. All right, Dan, you want to roll the die? Uh, sure. I want to roll. We haven't hit a lot of the black ones, so let's roll the <laughs> black one. Uh, ten. Ten. Spidey underscore Rich asks, "How would you approach large scale combat like a siege or a raid?" Oh, good question for me. I this like is an this entire stuff. episode, but let's try to hit episode. it. On the... Hit it real quick, but let's do it. We will get to doing an entire episode of this at some uh, point. Group your monster types. Uh, be more narrative and cinematic with your role playing. I would definitely break. I would do initiative, but combat itself 
would look different where uh, actions, bonus actions, and move actions would have to be done separately and your party should be uh, commanding groups of people rather than themselves versus a group of people. Like I would have them more running like your wizard's running the mages, your uh, fighter is running the uh, the main defending group and you're doing large groups at a time um, with like single rolls, right? Mm -hmm. And you're and basically you're rolling chances. So you're rolling a percentile chance and that is uh, depending on where you lie on that percentile chance is what will happen in that spot. Rolling big like sieges and whatnot gets very very difficult if you try to play the minutia of it. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely go more overarching umbrella version of the game sure. for that. Uh, for me, simplify it down to if you're having a large-scale battle, hex crawl style, whichever hex they're in, perception checks for, for them to determine what's happening in the adjacent hexes. You know what's happening in those hexes, but you've already predetermined what the outcome of the battle is. Their job is to try and survive the battle for a predetermined number of rounds. They can choose which hex to go into based on what you tell them is happening around the current one that they're in. And they just have to survive for a number of rounds. Okay. Um, first and foremost, I just got Strongholds and Followers by Matt Colville. Um, Ooh. And it is fantastic. And they actually, he has a method in it for how to run um, warfare and, and mass combat. However, his follow-up book is going to be called Kingdoms and Warfare. Oh, and it's going to address going to all of this good. shit. So... Everybody, right now, go find out how to support him and his uh, yeah. and his um, business. Uh, go out and buy Strongholds and Followers. That book is so beautiful. That it is fantastic. I I think it's a higher quality book than the D and D. Yeah, books. <laughs> like it, it's got glossier pages, and it's it's. I don't know. It I just like it. Really, very good. So, I was so impressed with that book when I saw it. Uh, um, but I think that we need more books like that. And if you go out and buy Strongholds of Followers, you're going to get an answer to this, as well as you'll be supporting a future answer that's coming. Cool. They're in the midst of writing it up and getting the logistics of that sorted out. My answer, though, personally, for me, as it stands right now, if you don't have access to that or you don't want to spend the money on uh, third-party supplemental books, I would say Tier 1... Give them a mission with the battle raging around them. Go scout this. Go sabotage that. Go out into the world and stay on the fringes of the battle and have the battle raging. And it's predetermined what's going to happen if they succeed or fail on two or three smaller missions. Blow up the bridge. Kill the, the sorcerer. Whatever it is on the outskirts of the battle. Yeah. At tier two, I say allow them to command units... Where they will all, like what Terry was saying about the hex crawl. That sounds great for tier two. Tier three is have them defending positions around the castle. At the drawbridge, they've got to stand there as waves and hordes. And it's a ticking clock. You have to make it through 30 rounds. Yeah. And the enemy will keep on coming. This is a numbers game. You will have NPCs that are getting shot. And I'm just running minions from 4th edition. Everybody has one hit point. Right? And you are trying... Except for the lieutenants or the sergeants or whatever. Siege monsters or whatever, yeah. Yeah, so... And then for tier 4, put them in the open battlefield. These guys should be wrecking shit. The action economy will be working against them. But if they stay tight together and they don't split the party then you can give them a big open battlefield with 300 different monsters allies and enemies and whatnot and you sit there and you roll a d20 to find out how or a, or a 2d20 you find out how many enemies fall and how many allies fall and then you let them impact the the area and survive again a certain number of rounds yeah, yeah. that's how i would do it that's different rewards so you can have different sieges and different raid you know, raids as you go so that would be that'd be how i would run it love it um who rolled that nonsense that was uh um, me you rolled that one didn't i no it was me that rolled it it's your yeah. turn okay, you're it's up. my turn um black is old black is old i'll do another one uh two Black two, nice dice baby asks, what what's your favorite <laughs> oh, best, yes. best handle All right, ever? Okay, best Instagram handle ever. Nice dice it. baby. Love it. Uh, asks, uh, girl what, boy, what's your favorite monster? And before any of us answer, I went back to the Meet the DMs episode, mm. Meet the DMs three, uh, where I said kobolds, Dan said beholders, and Terry said chromatic dragons. Has that changed? Has that changed? 
Um, it's changed for me. What you guys think? Let me say. Okay, you my favorite it. monster right now is Hags. I fucking love Hags yeah, like and everything about Hags. And since we recorded that, I did a bit of a deep dive personally for our, our own private campaign about Hags, and there's there's just there's nothing that's not goddamn awesome about them. And you can you can get devilish and diabolical with them or you can go fey with them or you can have little fairy tales with them or you can just do your own thing but I love covens I love everything about hags it's a lot of fun that's my answer yeah Dan? I kind of flow through the iconics for things that I love as my favorites and like I do love uh... would you say you, you like the tropes Dan? Uh, oh that's another one Rackham that's another one on the on the drinking game <sighs> I hate you people uh, the I like I like beholders. I like dragons. I like. We should do it's a mimic bingo. There all of these other little uh, races that are very iconic to Dungeons and Dragons, and I think my favorite one right now, especially with all of the uh, Baldur's Gate stuff that's coming out and, and um, the new Baldur's Gate game that's coming out specifically. All right, new name for a nightclub in Waterdeep: Baldur's Gate. Yeah. Sure, that that would work. Um, but I am loving, and I've done a lot of research into specifically how Mind Flayers and Illithid reproduce. God um, damn, that was going to be my answer. But right? I, I freaking, I'm, I'm in love with Mind Flayers. Uh, I, I'm currently trying to figure out a way in my homebrew campaign to have a very uh, astral battle between the relation uh, that involves a relationship between mind flayers and gith and how gith sit and how gith zerai and gith yankees specifically interact amongst each other i love the gif i've always loved the gif i'm for my answer for this question it's mind pronounced flayers. jith it is pronounced no GIF. no it is not pronounced jith yes it, it is. is gif i says will who? says the guy who's been playing the game for fucking 20 years it's gif <laughs> i will not have this nonsense it's jith I fucking hate you people. Okay, fine. All right, Terry, what's your answer? You, uh, can, you can also like Mind Flayers. No, you can't. We can't. No. I, no. No. Nope. Um, uh, <laughs> my heart will always be with dragons, but I would like to give an honorable mention to Rakshasas. Yeah. Because I am fascinated by that enemy that just will not stop. Will not stop. Big Terminator. You yeah. can send them back. I love that. The, the Terminator or the It Follows horror movies, that yeah. it will, it just will keep coming and you can't get rid of it and that stress that tension even if your campaign arc is something completely different you can't stop for too long without being like oh right fuck Dudley's still coming after us we still gotta keep moving fucking Dudley yeah fucking Dudley so uh, Rakshasas, one of the biggest one of the biggest regrets of my uh, pre-building Locky what are you going to say was, Prepubescent life. No, no. Uh, uh, for Lachlan Boyle, tell us about your gnome gnome of your directive. Yes, pre- pre- can't even speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> was of your pre- was saying life. his. Uh, I'm just soldiering on. Uh, was that his nemesis That's character a was a <laughs> Rakshasa, and I just kind of handed that to Adam, and he's like, "Sweet." And then in our current campaign, he is freaking everywhere. You never hand a Rakshasa to a DM. No. Never, That's never. That's like rule three or something. Next time I'm going to hand... And what's your nemesis, Dan? Oh, uh, a Sahawagan. <laughs> yeah, Sahawagan, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's me. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, I'm going to roll a uh, black die. On the black table, what did I get? A six? Uh, Maddie Yangu says, um, I'm hoping that a tournament-themed campaign comes together as an obstacle race of sorts. Any thoughts on stops along the way in an obstacle course kind of... Like uh, a military-style assault course? Is that what the... I, I guess. Yeah, I, I think so. Like, uh, think, think about like, oh, a, more like, a, like a tournament. Run. Okay. Right? So there's a tournament and there's an obstacle course. Right. Okay. What kind of stuff would you would you put in this obstacle course? Okay. I think you need to go fantastical with this with it being Dungeons & Dragons. So I don't... I would say don't take inspiration from the like Westeros-style mundane tournaments. Take inspiration more from like the Tri-Wizard tournament. Yeah, and yeah. have that level of stuff along the way with, uh, on the obstacle race. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a straight track. You could be plunging into the deep magical lake and dealing with the bullshit down there from the yeah. Feywild or whatever. And then you're coming back up. You should be going up a mountain and dealing with frost giants and boulders and all that I, stuff. I like the idea of there being a whole bunch of different portals as well. So you go through the yes. portal into the fire plane. You got to climb the volcano in the fire plane. Get to the portal there. You're back in the mundane world. Someone shooting crossbows. Then you got to go into the the shadow fell. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's a, that's a tier three, tier four. What are you doing for tier one, tier two? No, no, it doesn't. It, no, it, you can you can control it down so that you can be going into the fire plane, but 
you know, you may you may come out of the fire plane at a, at a rope bridge and something's going on there and then you get the portals on the other side. Yeah, it can be tier three, tier four, or you can control it and it can be on a smaller scale. Yeah, you'll notice I'm not throwing fire elementals. I'm not putting bad guys. I'm putting different terrain things yeah. in there. Also have a, a, a turn counter of sorts when each of your party, when your party is in each of these zones where with a... Uh, escalating scale of bad things that happen to them the longer it takes for them to beat this. Yeah, encounter. and I would even dumb it down to a lower level to where you're almost playing it like uh, Mario Party, where you're you're going down across squares and you have to just get to a certain point, but I, you can roll different, I, uh, different D20s I like D10s that. or but you make But you make it all a skill challenge, right? Yeah. So that when you go in there, you got to do an athletics to climb this thing, and then you pop out. You can't use the same skill more than once in each one of these areas. You've earned a D8 to roll instead of a D6 because you've done this thing. So yeah. Choose and when to do if it. If you fail, it holds you back a turn and yeah. it's it's get to the end of... This is fun. I like this. This is yeah. a fun game. Yeah. A Mario yeah. Party try wizard tournament. I'd throw something like that in. Yeah. Dan, any any final thoughts? Nope. That, that's good with me. Nice. Alright, cool. Uh, well, it's your turn to roll dice. Alright. Uh, I'll do the white one. White seven. We already did it. Do it again. That was Stooges. That's red. Red, 17. We already did it. Do it again. Black, 2. We just did God it. God damn it, <laughs> it Dan. White, 16. Don't, don't okay, dare. all right, okay. Oh I was this, Alexander, another Skip I'm Davis. This fucking close. says, what would you polymorph into if you had one polymorph spell? Cardi B. <laughs> all right, Terry, do you want to roll a die? Yeah. We all know why. God damn. <laughs> Well, if you could polymorph in anything, what would it be, Dan? Uh, I'm assuming it's got the same duration as polymorph. Yeah, which is what ten minutes? I don't remember off the top of my head, but um, an hour, isn't it? It might, might be. Uh, you know, I think it might be an hour. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. So if I could be anything in Dungeons and Dragons for an hour, in my real life, you'd be a succubus. No, no, I, no, um. I'd probably go dragon. That's a boring answer, but I would go dragon. Which one? Like, uh, Which one? Oh, I'd go with silver. Oh, yeah. You'd go for the most lawful good dragon ever. Yep. You're such a... Stop being dragon. I'd be one. a fucking Sturge you just could... to attack you. You, <laughs> you could be a fucking dragon and you go silver dragon. Yeah, why not? And, and, and he probably one. picks a young as well, because fuck. <laughs> God. Well, I need to be able to man. fit inside my house. At least you went dragon. Uh, me? Yeah, Terry. Ancient black dragon. Fucking right. Sadistic, evil. Do you know what my biggest worry is? That I would be counting down the minutes till I knew it was over. And it'd be gone and I'd be back to this mundane life. And then I would spend the rest of my life trying to become dragon again. But, yeah. Black dragon. Black dragon. Sure. What? No, sure. Why not? No, no, no. I was thinking, you could be a... I, I, the the rules of polymorph escaped me right now off the top of my head, but I would see if I could transform into like a solar or some sort of celestial creature in order to um, plane shift myself naturally onto a better realm of existence than this current one we're in where shit is going down. And if you did that near me, if we both polymorphed and I went black dragon and you did that, I would instantly be so mad that I'd fuck this up and you'd ruin dragon for me. <laughs> the worst hour ever. I'd be like, fuck. Now I'm just a big lizard. Spray, <laughs> I could vomit on things. Spraying my acid everywhere. All right. So uh, it lasts uh, for up to one hour. Nice. Yep. Has a range of That's 60 all I feet. Need, man. Yep. Okay. Um, I got a range of 60 feet. Up top. No. I'm not. I'm no. not. Giving you that one. Fuck All right. Um, honestly, my <laughs> my personality. I'm trying to figure out. It, like, is there a CR limitation on it? Oh, whatever, man. Mailbag. Do what you want. Okay. <coughs> I'd be an imp, and I'd be an imp because a it totally fits. I would run around and be a scary little devil, and I would torment people. But also, it would all. I would only use my powers to annoy. But I could also be invisible at will, and I can fucking fly. So you can't escape me. I'm coming. Yeah. And I and I believe that if I can be a familiar too, I, I can I can psychically get in somebody's head. I don't think polymorph lets me do that. No. But uh, no, I changed my mind. Mind flare. There we go. I want to be able to project my voice into other people's thoughts. Ah, yeah. But do you want to go to that level of intelligence and then be knocked back down again? Um, it's funny. I just read Flowers for Algernon. 
and it's the most heartbreaking shit in the world, and no. Hmm. No. What is Flowers for Elgernon? It is um, a very famous book, and I suggest everyone reads it. It's so famous, I don't mind giving spoilers. It's, it's an older book, but the premise is that there's a man who's mentally handicapped, and he gets a medical treatment that boosts up his intelligence to be even smarter than the average person. And then slowly it starts to slip away and return him back to it. Oh. And it's his God, it's no. his descent. Woof. Oh my God. Yeah, and it is... And that would be... But it's written as well from his point of view, so the language changes and shit in it as well. And who's the author? I That escapes me off the top Some of my head right super now. super genius, but it sounds... But, um, but it was... Like how his relationships change as well, and how nobody takes him seriously early on in his life, and then they, then by becoming smart, the dumb people in his life no longer trust him. They distrust him because this guy's all uppity and he's putting on airs and, and shit. And then he falls in love with a woman who kind of liked him before, but now he's a smart person. And then he he gets intelligent and then becomes distant, and she falls out of love with him mm -hmm. and then he returns to being unintelligent and she and she's fallen out of love with him so he doesn't have her anymore and like it, how intelligence is a curse and it's just oh it's heartbreaking you guys want it I'll, I'll lend it to you and what's the name of the book sir? Flowers for Algernon I'll yeah I'll read it it's by Daniel Keyes uh, K-E-Y-E-S sure great book yeah cool well alright thanks for that so Adam. that was the Jeez. polymorph question yeah. Um, was that, was that the, you that that was me that rolled it red's new I'll go three uh, we've yeah. done it fuck six yeah we've done it come on hey, Terry come on man I didn't do it three times in a row did I I might do it seven, right. seven. we've done that one too set yeah. twice in a row uh, and four, we did Cap four as three well three times in a row you son of a bitch <laughs> Ten. We didn't uh, do ten. Ah, <laughs> uh, hey, it's the zombie night. The hey. zombie night. AKA it's Jeff. Hefe. Um, Every time Jeff comments, that's what I sing. It's uh, on my phone. Asks, can we just have a whole episode where Adam and Terry try to make Dan as uncomfortable about sexual things as they can? Yes. Love you, Dan. Yes, we can. <laughs> Jeff. Yeah. Jeff, we'll do that. Yes, we will Jeff, absolutely man, Jeff, do that. Jeff, but I would like to take requests. So if you what the fuck, your, Jeff? If you said in your top three things that you'd like us to make feel Dan uncomfortable about... Why would you do this to me, Jeff? We've covered things already. We've covered BDSM. You guys, like... Sucking dicks. I, I am just so, like, vanilla with my life. And you guys are just sitting here like, oh, let's make Dan I'm squirm. fucking Rocky Road, man. Let's let's ramp this shit up. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Um, I Don't hate, go down this rabbit hole. There's no... I, I there's hate no this idea. This rabbit hole, man. No, I, I hate this idea and would really rather not. <laughs> Next episode. Come on. Oh, fuck. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. All right. The next episode will have a disclaimer at the beginning of it. We, let's just go balls to the wall. On this. Let's just go balls to the Dan on this. Yeah. Speaking of balls to the, in fact, no, it doesn't. Matter. It's my turn. White. Thirteen. Uh, white thirteen. No, we haven't done that. See, I'm so good at this dice rolling thing, guys. Um, it is your favorite character, a dog person or a cat person. Oh, uh, my not, favorite. Not you. Your favorite character uh, well, that you've played. My dog favorite character. My favorite character that I played is a dog person. So as much as I like cats, I just think people do cats wrong. But that's my personal Why? opinion. In my humble opinion, because they lock them up and make them that, so that they can't leave. Cats are supposed to roam. Tom cats are supposed to have a ten square kilometer um, area to um, territory that they roam. They shouldn't be locked up inside all the time. So I think people do cats wrong, and it makes them assholes. I don't think cats are assholes. I think they're assholes if you lock them up. That's just me, um, having had two cats in my life. My two favorite characters that I've ever run have been very um, isolated in their own in, uh, minds kind characters. And uh, they, by nature, push people away. So, like, the unconditional love of a dog really appeals to those kind of guys. So, it, uh, and... To be completely honest, it appeals more to me. I'm more of a dog person than a cat person. Um, so even though I owned a cat for ten years, um, I yeah, dogs. You want you want to know something, guys? As a DM, I have to say because I play DM. That's it. I guess I'm a cat person because I have Tabaxi, tabaxi. and there is no dog opportunity. There's the closest you're gonna get is a knoll. 
Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I, which is one of your favorite races. I, yeah, but they're hyenas. They're not even... I mean, they're canine family, I guess. Yeah. I, a lot of, uh, a lot of there's also, other uh, languages call them cat dogs. There's also uh, hound archons, but those are nope, more... Nope, not in 5th ed. They're not in 5th ed. Mm, nope. They're wolves. Oh. Like, yeah. yeah. Play like Anther, play Shifter. I, yeah, but Shifter, that's that's Eberron variant shit, right? Like, that's not in standard 5th ed. I, I guess maybe. I don't know. So I guess my answer is Tabaxi. I do like Tabaxi quite a lot. I think that they can be a little bit mysterious and they can be very weird based on their lore. But do you think dogs really love us unconditionally, or do you think they're playing on our weakness? My uh, dog I, pretends to be hurt if she's not getting attention. I think they play on our weakness, but I think they also do uh, love us more than the average person will love us. Hmm. They're more excited to see us. I think that is built their into. I, I think it's built into their DNA that they uh, they need a pack leader and they succumb and and submit to a pack leader and you are the alpha yeah. in their pack and therefore that's what yeah you provide to them and therefore get their love. If you stop providing, they will turn on you. Yeah, is that love? That sounds like conditional love to me. <sighs> rough. That is fairly rough. Oh! Shit, son. That's right. All right, so we only get one more question, That's and Terry just earned it. Exactly. So Dan, you don't get the roll. Chris Rock says only. Uh, what did he say? Only women, children, and dogs get unconditional love. Men don't. So there you go, Dan. That's I it. saw that That's quote it. earlier this week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one more question, and then we're all done. Yep. The last one. I'll go, last one. Let's go new, right? Yep. For for the last one. Uh, Twelve. Do oh, it's Dice Cats again. Hi, Dice Cats. What known characters? have inspired PCs or NPCs that you've created? I tend to use a lot from Deadwood. That is the exact same question phrased in a different way. We're not doing it, Dice Cats. You heard it already, all right? Next. I'm not doing it. 17. That was that was Dice Cats' first time. Dice Cats, shut up. Seven. We've done this already. Okay, you have been revoked. No. You are no longer no, allowed. No. no. Dan? Three. We've done it already. God damn, that was <laughs> Rackham. Ten. Ten. We've done it already. It was <laughs> Zombie <laughs> Night. <laughs> Two. Two. Five. All right, hold on. Talus 21. How would you go Something about... Like 15 times to get that dice. How would you go about lowering the magic level in a campaign, making magic more rare and fantastical, while not crippling your players against magic-resistant creatures? Boost your martial. Boost your mundane skill. Boost... Um, I would boost your... So you think comparatively, by boosting up everything else, magic becomes a mundane? Uh, I, I think the lesser forms of... I think if you're boosting the martial, and martial's kind of got that easier gate into it, um, a lot of your NPCs in the world that you're building will have that more martial bend to them. Um, make magic rarer by it just not being in the NPCs and whatnot. But also boosts the um, martial capabilities of uh, your players to make the art, the magic more special. I um, I disagree. I, yeah, I disagree with that. And I'm going to tell you why. Because there's Just too many carry. variables in this. There's too many variables and some are being ignored and some are not. So the question is, how can you reduce magic capabilities without crippling them against magically resistant characters? So Dan, where you went there with boosting martial, yes, is an idea. But all that does is it, it boosts martial, decreases magic, uh, decreases casters, so now why would I play a caster if these guys are getting boosted? I'm not saying, I'm not. like... like. But my, my question is to this question, if magic is decreased in your campaign, why is magic resistance still at the same level? Why? Because that is, yeah, in itself, it is, in itself, it is magical. You are magically able to resist against magic. So... Why is that still a thing if magical resistance... Sorry, if, if magic capability is reduced, magical resistance should also be reduced okay. to the level of playing field. All right, so here's my answer. I like where you're going with that, and I'm going to take it a step further. And I'm looking at warlocks. Warlocks get level 5 spells, but then only one level 6, one level 7, one level 8, one level 9 spell slot, right? Yeah. And that's it. So they have easy access to level 5, up to level 5, and then really nothing beyond that. So what I would say is... If this is a homebrew world, homebrew campaign, because that's what we're talking about here is, is changing the inherent um, aspects to it. I would say only have the world around you 
have access to up to level five spells. Right. So all of the magic stuff still exists. You can still be resistant to fireball or, or anything else. I would have it be less frequent, like you're saying. There are just fewer NPCs mm -hmm. with it. I think that wizarding schools are rarer. I think that not every priest is a cleric and not every friar is a monk, right? So it's very rare and you're imbued with this power. I think that maybe you have to go through trials to get to the next level. Yeah, and, and this everybody be part of does. Campaign. Even a fighter, everybody needs to go through a certain number of trials. And you would set this up ahead of time and just be when you hit six level magic, you are a demigod. You nobody else has this level of magic. That's crazy batshit insane. So by the time that you are fulfilling wishes, you are a god. Level 18, 19, or 20, you yeah, are a god. You're the ceiling, them. really. Yeah. Right? yeah. So what, what I'm doing is I'm just keeping the NPCs from... That way, Dan, it's the same effect. Yeah. Everybody with the martial stuff still stays as, as equal for low levels. All the NPCs and stuff are, are yeah. on the same board. Up until, what, tier 3 was where you start to get level 6, yeah. right? And so that's that's when you should be blowing up as a, as a freaking superhero anyway, right? So... Anyway, so that's been the uh, the mailbag episode, guys. Uh, let's wrap it up by doing our contact info. Dan, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, so uh, just in general, at first you could uh, check us out at Facebook, um, at the It's a Mimic page. We're also on Instagram, at It's a Mimic. Uh, we are on Twitter, at It's a Mimic d, d You could also, and we would really appreciate it, if you went to our website, uh, there's a lot of other offers. Our store is there with where you can pre-order these awesome shirts. Um, there is uh, so www.itsamimic.com for that. Um, you can also listen to the episodes on the website too. They're all you there. You really can, right? yeah, so. yeah. The website's really our hub for all of this stuff, right? So, um, as for me personally, you can find me on Instagram at Oscar the Orc with underscores in case. Uh, you can find me at Send Noobs DND on Instagram. And you can find me at Rusty Styrofoam. But again, like Dan said, we're all on at It's a Mimic on Instagram. Yeah. Um, and uh, that seems to be the best way for people to get a hold of us, uh, which is where most people got a hold of us about the giveaway. Thank you for listening to It's a Mimic. Check us out online at itsamimic.com or on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Have questions you would like answered by the guys on the show? Send them an email to itsamimic at gmail.com. Tune in every Tuesday for more. Now, let's talk about the giveaway. Let's break it down. Here we go. I have calculated. You guys voted uh, about the giveaway, right? Um, where we ran it for three months and we had dozens and dozens of people enter and then I had to come up with some sort of metrics and analytics system to be able to figure out who's going to win, what are our requirements. I ended up knocking it down to the top five or six people. I think I said eight people and then we voted on them yeah. um, based on what the popular answers were or what was even in the realm. There were some things that were like, well, Dan is an Indiana Jones. I'm like, okay, thank you, no. Uh, that's not what the thing was, right? Yeah. How many, how many uh, told you that you were a pink ranger? Uh, well, you know what? I got a few like of, of shit like that, right? Yeah. So there were a lot of responses. A lot of them were garbage. A lot of them were, well, you guys are human bards because you're on a <laughs> podcast. And I'm like, we told you like nine times, don't fucking do that, <laughs> right? So bless them. So That's I gra right. So I grabbed what I thought were the were the top, and then I farmed them out to you and had you guys vote. So first and foremost, here is uh, here's what I want to say. Overall, it was determined that, let's start with Dan. Dan is a halfling bard. The fuck? College of Lore with a clan crafter background. <laughs> that is what Terry and I thought. Okay, okay, can we talk? So, so, we, so I split it up by, by race and by class yep, yep, yep. and by background, and we voted on each of them separately, and then I took the number one answers on each and smashed them together. So there's not one best answer, but then based on, on the votes of those, I ranked them all together and then did the math to see who had the best rank Okay, all right, for the winner. But, Dan, you ended up being a halfling bard, College of Lore, with a clan crafter background. Do we think this is accurate and why? Uh, I, I think that it's accurate because, first of all, he's got a halfling's persona. You don't get to say anything in this. We're talking but, about But he, loves, he also loves small people. He does love small people. He, he keeps the making game. them, right? Yeah, so, in the game. I've made a few. 
you are a bard because, well, yeah, I guess it's like a podcast Lord. thing. You're you're knowledgeable and you do uh, creative, expressive things with playing your game. I'm also legitimately podcast. a musician. Yeah. And, and, so, that too. and then Clan Crafter, I mean, you keep talking about the furniture that you're building for everybody, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's... The orders are rolling in. And uh, also, anyway. my furniture is rolling in because I'm starting to put casters on things. No, that's um, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other, however, my two favorite answers that were not that were cleric. He had, a lot of them had reasoning for death. Was, yeah. yeah, was generic cleric. Good name for a band. Was just <laughs> just cleric from uh, Pepperina who said cleric because Jesus. And that was her whole reasoning. Why. <laughs> Three words: cleric, because Jesus. Sure. And then uh, Ohio, I guess. And then Colton Adrian said druid, circle of spores, because druid of spores, because with a cough like that, what else would he be? Hmm. So there you go, Dan. <laughs> so who said that one? <laughs> no, I no, yeah, yeah. no, no, no. He's going to be my nemesis for my next character, <laughs> Colton Adrian. Thanks, so, Colton. So your backup character. Your name's a horse. Your no, <laughs> weird part so, horse. Yeah. So Colton, um, with your last name for first name and your, first your name for a backup last name. character is going oh, to be a I love it. gnome cleric, forge domain. So all of this tracks so far for the yeah. same reason. Love it, guild artisan. Yeah. Cool. Okay. The person that was the closest overall that got the best rank for you was uh, at Kane Morwind. And uh, the second closest was Jackie Rackham. Cool. Oh, really? Yeah. She likes to get involved in this stuff. She's funny. And she really thinks it through as well. Yeah, she did. Yeah. Yep. Um, so for. Well, let's do Terry. So now Dan and I get to talk about this. Oh, moi? Yep. So. I'm expecting something great. So you are. <laughs> this is so on the nose. A half elf bard. I thought you were gonna say halfling for a second, and I was I I instantly got mad as soon as he said halfling. Half elf bard. <laughs> half elf bard. College of glamour. Yeah. With an outlander background. Yeah. That is. Neither of us really liked anything. At, like that was not our first, except for the the um, college of glamour bard. Yeah. Right. We both just went. Oh yes, obviously yes, that. Obviously college. Yeah, of why glamour. college of glamour? The the, uh, the rest of it. Have college? you seen your Instagram feed? Seriously. It's memes. And you. Well, that's what... With every, the camera pointed towards you. That's what everybody's Instagram is. And it's f- fireworks and shots and we take pictures of your dog and glow-in-dark wheels on your skateboard. No, it's... it's yeah, Okay, dude. fair one. Yeah. All right, so here's what we have uh, about... Love you, bud. Love you. Here's what we have about Terry. Uh, Pepperina said, Terry's a barbarian because he is always raging at Dan. Yep. And also, true. we had uh, Kane Morwin say... There is a Storm Herald barbarian uh, because of the extravagant outbursts he makes towards Dan and how he just goes into a rage whenever Dan interrupts him. Barbarian, no doubt. I'm Storm Herald heard. because he is uh, because he does have knowledge of D anD D, which leads to a kind of an equivalent to arcane knowledge. I've never really thought of myself as a barbarian. <coughs> Dan, fuck but, me. But Colton Adrian, who just smeared Dan's character. Uh, also smeared yours and said, Bard because of the BDSM. College of Glamour because I've seen his Insta videos. What's wrong with my Insta videos, which I don't do too much anymore? So, there you go. Enjoy <laughs> that. Oh, I'm sorry that I have it in, in my Instagram videos. It is my face, which hey, I hey, assume hey, you hey, want hey, to hey. see. You're not allowed to talk about yeah. this. <laughs> so, I wasn't allowed to defend myself. You're not allowed to defend okay. yourself. So, so the, um, the person that got this closest was actually Colton Adrian, who just said that about you. <laughs> so, um, but uh, your backup character is a dragonborn arcane trickster with a far traveler background. Okay. Uh, now, when we were doing this, you had descriptions for everything, and the description for Outlander was perfect. And I was going to go Far Traveler, and then I wrote what uh, the description for... Uh, uh, why someone said Outlander? Why someone said Outlander, and I was like, no, no, it's that. that. Why, why Outlander? Well, um, Colton Adrian said uh, Outlander because of his love for exploring and wandering about the world. Um, Fair um, one, Colton Adrian. The, the, I decided I like you now. The zombie knight actually has a big spiel, and I'm going to go into that at the end as well. Okay. Um, but okay. Uh, your uh, yeah, your backup was uh, Dragonborn, and you kind of got called out for having an ego as well, which is why you got Dragonborn. What ego? Yeah, uh, hold on. I can tell you. Uh, let me tell you exactly who said that. That was... Da, 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 da. Going flipping through the pages here. Uh, Dragonborn... Um, Jackie Rackham says you're cocky as fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I have... Fuck you, Internet. (laughs) I have devoted my life to helping other people. And I'm cocky. Yeah, because you know more than them. All right, so... (laughs) 
Uh, and they're all idiots. <laughs> so um, what ego, Adam? So for me, you guys voted that it's Aleskan human, which is a kind of specific human that was in the uh, Sword Coast, right? I don't know, sweet fuck, all about Alaskan human. So thanks, guys. I think sure. it's uh, like west of Yukon, but I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> um, I can it's Alaskan. I, Right. No, it's a uh, goddamn again guys. vowels. Um, and the reasoning was from Jackie Rackham. who said ambition, Alaskan, because y'all were just talking about being pale. LOL. Alaskan? Did you mean to say it? But you said Alaskan. I said Alaskan. You just can't hear vowels. You just said Alaskan right there. Alaskan so, right there. Uh, oh, Alaskans um, are fair-skinned ginger from the north of the Sword Coast. I'm not even joking. They're also called Northlanders. That's it. That's, I'm a Northlander. Yeah, I feel like I I'm a right. Northlander. From Canada, right? So. I'm a Northlander. Uh, ter- uh, so the, the the Wikipedia uh, says tall, fair skinned, blue or steel gray eyes, uh, living on the islands of the Trackless Sea or the Icewind Dale. More blonde hair and uh, than red and brown. Those in the uh, Sword Coast North and surrounding land, lands. Um, were more Netherese. You guys were the ones who fought against the Netherese. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you're based you out guys, of the, you're, you're, you're based out of the town of Luskin. Sure. Yeah. I will take your word for it. I'm a generic bard with a cloistered scholar background. You guys both fucking loved that. The cloistered scholar. Yeah, you're a nerd well, who, who shuts himself in a room and reads. Cloistered, reading. though? Really? Not yeah, it's, it's just shutting yourself in a room and reading. You guys are mean to me. Anyway, my my favorite thing was uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, I just got torn apart. Fucking pardon. Excuse me. Uh, uh, because we said you Sean Crawford. He's egotistical, and I'm diseased. I'm not Thanks, egotistical. Internet. Sean Crawford. That's okay. Listen, Sean Crawford said that I would be a wild magic sorcerer because I am inherently evil, but do not, uh, but not nearly as bad as I make myself out to be. Also, I'm the de facto leader and face of the group. So. <laughs> That kind of makes sense. Uh, I often make decisions on your behalf, although uh, I'm unable to help myself from injecting a little chaos whenever I get the chance. That's f- actually, yeah, that's actually very, very accurate. I fucking hate everybody. <laughs> um, and uh, Avatar Italia was was overall the closest. We all liked uh, different people. Uh, I sided with Sean Crawford and the Zombie Knight more often than anyone else. Dan sided with Sean Crawford and Colton Adrian more than anyone else. And you, Terry, uh, sided with Avatar Italia and Kane Morwind more than anyone else. Mm. So, the, oh, Whose names both sound like D&D characters. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think Kane Morwind is a... Uh, is actually a Elder Scrolls a fake name? Yeah, that's a mm. it's an Instagram name. Is it Elder Scrolls, uh, but I'm Morrowind. I'm assuming. Huh. But um, before we uh, get right into it, I'll tell you what the runner-up was the Zombie Knight, who gave us a huge chunk of why we are what we are. He wrote damn stories about us. Yeah, it's like a page and a half, and I'm going to read them after the credits for everybody. Um, and it's going to take a few minutes, so settle in and get comfortable. He was our runner-up, and because he put so much effort into this, I'm just going to mail him a fucking min- uh, mini. Yeah. Because he, like, oh my God, I, I said, yeah, give us a little reasoning. He wrote nine pages. It was ridiculous. So, thank you, uh, Jeff, the zombie knight. Yeah, Jeff. We'll put little tiny signatures on it for you, uh, which will massively reduce the value, but still. Yeah, there, there we go. go. Um, and uh, But our, our winner is Sean Crawford. So, Yay, Sean, congratulations, Sean. Sean. Yeah, we liked all of your stuff the best by a fucking landslide, too. So, overall, both Dan and I uh, liked your stuff more than anybody else's. And, uh, and Terry, I think you had him at, uh, I can tell you right now, he was the third uh, best. In I don't like people to get too cocky, so... So, so you just drag him down a notch, eh? Pull it down a bit. So I you guys thought it was excellent. I went, I went, sorry. So uh, we've got uh, dice box uh, that we're going to hand out. We've got, uh, we need Sean. We're going to send you a private message. We want your uh, T-shirt size as well. We've got a Mimic Mini. Dan, what else do we have? Uh, we've got a dice bag. We've got a we've got we've got three dice boxes. Well, we're gonna give him one. What does yeah. anyone need three for? Uh, we've got uh, the uh, mimic minis. We have a adventure path from uh, Tiny Dungeons. We're gonna throw your way. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and then you also get this personal shout out because we kind of like you. Uh, we also have uh, you two definitely game like accessories him, from like Deep Dungeons. <laughs> Uh, game accessories from Deep Dungeons we're going to be throwing in there as well for you guys um, 
Yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff in this little swag bag. Sure, oh. we'll take pictures of it. We'll post it along when we release this as well, um, so that everybody can see all the cool swag. We'll tag you, Sean, and uh, everybody. Here's the wacky music. Um, you guys know where to find us already. Before the music kicks in, Terry, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me at Send Noobs D and D. Congratulations, Sean. You can find me at Rusty Styrofoam. Congratulations, everyone else. Um, you can find me at Oscar underscore the underscore orc, all with uh, K's, and uh, fuck you, Colton. Uh, yep. And remember, I'm kidding. Remember, I can't do that for too long. For those, awesome. You're getting my books. For those of you who don't win, it's not that you're losers. It's just you're not as cool as Sean Crawford. I don't. I wonder if Sean's ever heard that before. You know what? You can put that on your like outgoing voicemail message. There you go. Hmm. You've reached Sean Crawford, and he's the greatest person ever, according to the It's a Mimic podcast. Beep. <laughs> Anyways, you can reach all of us at It's a Mimic on Instagram, at It's a Mimic D&D on Twitter. Check out our Facebook page. Leave us reviews on YouTube. Uh, leave us iTunes reviews. Check us out on Spotify as well. We're all over the place. Check us out, www.itsamimic.com. Send us an email at info at uh, itsamimic.com. And uh, other than that, we're out. Stay tuned for the Zombie Knight's long, rambling, ridiculous stories where it turns out that uh, Terry's going to learn something about himself. What? What am I going to learn?